I'm going to come down to the bottom since that seems to be popular for speakers. Anyone here uh, currently do pellet implantation in their practices? Can you show hands? And obviously people who are not doing it, I hope you're interested in this. I got exposed to pellets about three and a half years ago by Dr. Rebecca Glazer in uh, Dayton, Ohio. And at that time, as a member of Biologic MD, we were all required to go through pellet training. And now it's optional. In fact, I'm doing the training on the West Coast. But uh, when I learn something that intrigues me, I, I kind of seize the, uh, the reins and started doing it actively. And it, it was a wonderful addition to my practice. I hope after hearing this presentation, you have an interest in learning more about it and actually go through formal training. So what common complaints do our patients come in with? I picked five common ones. One is lack of satisfactory sex, too much body fat, poor memory, lack of energy. So how can we approach these patients in a logical way? You may find, like I do, it's difficult to introduce, introduce hormonal-related subjects to patients who really don't want to look at literature and studies. They need really more of a conceptual idea, a right-brained idea of how hormones work. Now, Western medicine, we know that our goal is to treat symptoms. We use stimulants, we use sedatives, we we'll use mood elevators, tranquilizers, and we we'll use other drugs. The goal is to relieve symptoms but not cure the patient. In fact, the assumption that's made when you come in with depression or irritable bowel syndrome or low libido is that this is incurable and the doctor won't look at a solution. Whereas our goal is to look at causes of these conditions, address daily lifestyle in ways that make sense. And we want to find ways of alleviating the symptoms, but also we want to heal or cure. This is our menu, and this is all part of our fellowship training. We learn all these techniques. Environmental inputs such as diet, nutrition, exercise, energy production. We want to focus on low immune status and high immune status to bring it back to normal. We want to address inflammation, GI function, toxicity. If the patient's toxic, we want to detoxify. And of course, we want to achieve hormonal balance. We want to look at neurotransmitter balance, structural balance, and mind and spirit. So this is the menu that we bring to the table when we see a patient, so much more advanced than just pharmaceuticals. So I came up with an idea, a simplified model of analyzing basically any medical condition. In fact, you can take any disease and classify it using this model. And this was in my first book, which was published in 2002, and it's called The Cellular City. Imagine that there's a city inside a living cell. And these are the roles of the, of the cell and the roles of a city. In the city, we have power production. In the cell is ATP production. Sanitation in the city was detoxification. Transportation would be circulation. Supermarkets would be nutrition. Water supply would be hydration. Civil engineering is protein synthesis. Communication would be the nervous system and hormones. And finally, the fire department, police department would be the immune system. So here's a healthy woman, healthy city. What happens when the essential city services are curtailed? We see slums, or in a case of a, of a human being, cachexia. And of course, AARP refers to this as healthy aging. As you know, they're not very much in favor of hormones. Now, we've classified broad groups for, uh, of women who are, have achieved hormonal decline. They're in menopause, and men felt left out, so we came up with the term andropause. But obviously we know that in men the transition is much, much more gradual. So what information do we need to tell our patients to convince them that testosterone is a valuable hormone to start? Well, looking at men, of course, we know that andropause occurs in a gradual way, beginning in the 40s, continuing into the 50s, and it's associated with a decline in testosterone. Some men will have a, a much delay in testosterone decline, so the testosterone levels are excellent into their 50s, 60s, and 70s. But that is unusual. Typically, by age 45, 25% of men have subtherapeutic levels of testosterone, and by age 70, men will typically have about 30% of their youthful levels. This was a study in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism. Testosterone declines associated with reduced muscle mass, changes in body composition, and bone loss. There are three studies looking at diminished testosterone associated with low libido. That's kind of a no-brainer. Men with higher levels of testosterone seem to have lower 
risks of cardiovascular disease. So increasing age, decreasing HDL levels, and decreasing free testosterone levels are independent risk factors predicting the severity of coronary artery disease. It was a 10-year study on 11,600 men between the ages of 40 and 79. Low testosterone predicted cardiovascular disease. High endogenous testosterone showed low mortality from heart disease and cancer. And high testosterone showed no increase in prostate cancer. But paradoxically, fear of causing prostate cancer has prevented many men from receiving testosterone. And women, testosterone is very important. Obviously, premenopausally, testosterone is reduced by the ovaries, and postmenopausally, largely by the adrenals. It improves libido, it improves assertiveness, reduces fat, increases muscle mass, and helps protect the bones.